Uh, I'm sorry for being late. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, day. Thank you for adding one more day in our lives. We thank you for the fellowship we are enjoying. It's because of you. And uh, having the privilege of studying your word along with one another. We thank you for your protection in our life, oh God. As we look around, many people are affected because of uh, this COVID-19. Many have lost their jobs. Some of them have lost their loved ones. And uh, very sad to see that uh, uh, the bad effect of COVID-19 has really affected our whole society, our nation, and even the world. In this context, as we study your word, Lord, help us to be very focused. Even as we have uh, studied from the book of Galatians thus far, we pray that you help us in such a way that we will practice what we are learning. In a very special way, we pray for uh, Paul's teaching on this doctrinal teaching on uh, grace and freedom will be, real, will be a reality in our life and will be passing on to others. Even tonight, as we are going to continue our study, we pray that you bless our time together. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I really thank God for the privilege of uh, studying God's word with you, Galatians. Uh, though it's a bit a familiar passage, book for us, I'm excited to study along with you. God has ministered to me, and as we close this uh, study, my only point is how we are going to pass it on, this message to others. It's not only taking in Bible studies. Maybe in a smaller sections, we can pass on the message to others, and we need to help believers and Christian friends who are struggling in their doctrinal teachings. God willing, next week, uh, we want to go back to Old Testament. And there's a strong suggestion that we can study the book of Hosea. So we'll be studying the book of Hosea from next Monday onwards. Last Monday, when we looked at uh, Galatians, we were excited that it was the first book, not only written by Paul, even the New Testament book. So we looked at the introduction part, and then we looked at the background. We have seen the main message of Galatians. When we looked at the first introduction part, we were very much disturbed by the way in which Paul was agitated to see that uh, people who are against the gospel, they have brought a new idea that uh, if you have to be Christian, you have to be a Jewish first and then follow the law. And we have seen the bad news about the good news. Later, we have seen that uh, Paul's personal walk with God, his own personal experience in his uh, Christian life. And we have seen the one gospel he was holding on. And for the sake of the gospel to the Gentiles, he has confronted Peter. And later he could clearly say, uh, he could clearly say that uh, uh, justification by faith is my reality in my life. Not I, but Christ is my experience. That's the way he shared. Yesterday, we looked at uh, the doctrine on law and grace. We saw that chapter 3 and 4 is about uh, doctrine teaching. And uh, some of them came and disturbed the Galatians. So Paul has to scold them, foolish Galatians. And they have lost their first love towards God and towards Paul. But later, in fourth chapter, we got a beautiful message that we are not slaves, but we are children. And God sent by sending his son and by sending his spirit, we got, have the privilege of uh, experiencing that uh, blessings of a child. And in the end, we have seen that Abraham and Moses are representing uh, God's promises and God's law. And uh, though it is 430 years back, the law has come. God's promises to Abraham is a reality, and it's fulfilled not in the law, but it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, in the cross, and because of the precious blood of Christ, and having faith in that, we have the promise of God. So Paul could clearly say that uh, the law cannot stop the promise of God, though law is needed. That was the doctrinal teachings we have received yesterday. 
today, as we have noted down in the beginning, it's going to be unpractical. The practical Christian life is a freedom in Christ Jesus. That's a focus. Chapters 5 and 6. First passage we are going to look at is uh, walk in faith and love. Faith and love is important. That's what he mentions in this passage. Second passage, walk by the spirit. There's a conflict between flesh and spirit and fruit of the spirit is coming in this passage. So when we walk in the spirit, we have the fruit. Third paragraph, it's about the true Christian relationship. As we have this freedom, we need to enjoy that freedom in the community of God's people. That's what he's talking. And he's closing with the, the powerful message about cross and it's the mark of the freedom. There are some specific marks of the freedom. When you say that we are free people, there are some marks. We are not in a position to read both the chapters, but I requested uh, dear Anu from Ranchi, I see you, will be reading the passage for us. Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 to 18. Anu? Yes. Reading from Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 to 18. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anu. Anu is a local student, and I'm so happy that uh, she could attend uh, the Bible studies regularly. And uh, we look at law cannot take over the grace. And the grace of God is given by God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, law is needed to know where we are wrong. But uh, because of the grace, we are having a free life. We have freedom in Christ. That's the way it closes in chapter 4. In fact, the last verse, that is 31. Galatians chapter 4 verse 31 says like this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave women but of the free women. We are not like, we are like Isaac and uh, we are the children of Sarah and Abraham, the promises God has kept. And now we are indeed free. Verse one in chapter five, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again the yoke of slavery. Earlier, we were under law, but when it is uh, uh, by faith, when we receive the salvation, now we are delivered from the law. And now we are free. Don't go back to any other uh, slavery. That's a message he wanted to communicate. To the believers, he says uh, clearly, uh, mark my words, Chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, he says, Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. If you give importance to outward things, like Gentiles have to have the circumcision, then only they can become a Christian. That's definitely 
uh, outward thing. To you, Christ will not be no value at all. And he, he continues with the same saying, with uh, we have to uh, depend on faith and love. Look at verse 5 and 6. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith in the righteousness for which we hope. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has no value, has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through faith, through love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's what he says very clearly. No, even now, my dear brothers and sisters, don't be confusing yourself with uh, many other uh, bondages. I'm not saying that uh, you are church regulations and uh, your church principles. You have to adopt. For example, in some churches, they keep that uh, white dress. It's a must. And you cannot have jewelry. Fine. If you, if you believe and then you have taken it in the right spirit, do it with all sincerity. But don't say only with... Uh, a white sari, then you can be holy. Something like that. There are many, many things. I'm just giving you one simple example. There could be many, many examples. By doing that, people can call you as a believer. If people can call you as a child of God, that is wrong. That is wrong. And in your own church tradition, if they have any other thing, you have to follow being a person who is committed to the church. But clearly, Paul says here, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Same thing in chapter 6, verse 15, he says, uh, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. What counts is new creation. My brothers and sisters, make note of it. The outward things, it is not important. The inward thing of being a new creation, it's very important. And uh, the faith expressing itself through love. That's the reason Paul could write to other epistles like Colossians, Thessalonians, there and all. He says, I praise God for your faith in God and your love for one another. Very clearly he mentions. So we need to keep these two together. We cannot say that I have faith, but I don't, I don't like to show love. It's not possible. So faith expressing itself through love, it's uh, the mark of a believer. Verse 7 to 14, it's a continuation, but there's a shift. The shift is uh, there he's talking about the teachers, not individual believers. He's talking about the teachers. You are running a good race. Who cut in? you to keep you from obeying the truth. The kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Then he says, a little yeast works through the whole bag of doubt. We all know that the false teachers, when they come, they spoil and the whole assembly, the whole church, whole fellowship is spoiled. That's what he's talking about. The teachers will be minority. One or two will come, but they'll be very strong in their teachings. And we are carried away by their false teachings. And he's, uh, in a nice way, he says, you are running a good race. Lovely to see that. You are running a good race. Our Christian life is compared to race. Even to the Corinthians, Paul could say that. And we need to keep the goal, the price, and we need to run. And to, this, to Timothy, he says that when you run, keep your rules. You cannot afford to run here and there. You have to be very focused. That's what he says. But when you're running in the race, there are people coming and disturbing us, the wrong teachers. And we need to complete the race faithfully, in faith, showing in love. Keep that in mind. Verses 13 to 15, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, 
very clear that's a freedom god has given us he has, we are called to be free so none of us who are participating in this bible study should be under any bondage we need to be really free that's what god has called us if you are a real child of god you have to be free you need to be excited with your christian life if any of you who have a challenge of doubtful or not enjoying your freedom in christ jesus check your commitment you are called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh that is a complaint those false teachers gave you talk about freedom and you indulge in sin flesh then he says no not at all but i need to fulfill the law in love but i cannot have the freedom in love in a licensed way in the name of uh, love i cannot uh, do anything and everything that was a complaint they gave but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh that's a very uh, strong statement we all need to be very very careful when we say that i am free it's not that we can do everything and anything in christ the holiness is important and we are set apart and not only that he says sir so one another humbly in love the love should be the criteria we all know that first corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 to 7 beautifully describes this love first corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 onwards the whole chapter talks about love and there uh, the love is pure such an agape love god's love we need to reflect and we need to show this love with one another and that is the faith in love so god has called us to be free and we love him and by faith we uh, believe in him and we need to show that love to others that's paul's teaching and later even first john when we studied we have seen the same teaching john is giving very clearly that is from christ you love your god wholeheartedly and love your neighbors as you love others let's continue when you look at the second paragraph chapter 5 verse 16 to 26 there he says uh, so i say walk by the spirit after saying that he says so i say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh it is about uh, the uh, people who are complaining that we have license no not at all if you walk by spirit you will not have license to fall into sin or you will not gratify the desires of flesh and uh, he says for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want whatever you want very clearly he says there's a conflict between flesh and spirit my dear brothers and sisters i need to make a, a warning to you when you talk about flesh it is not paul is talking about body alone because there are different types of philosophies are there our christians and non christians they have a type of a philosophy saying that our body is bad our spirit is good so punish the body you whatever possible ways you can punish the body so that your spirit will get freedom your spirit your spirit will be happy that is definitely a wrong teaching so when you say here that uh, there is a conflict between flesh and spirit it is not between body and soul it is about the uh, lust of the flesh and it is a, a flesh in terms of the sinful nature sinful nature romans 8 chapter we see that when you look at uh, romans chapter 8 verse 9 you however not in the realm of the flesh but are in the realm of the spirit if indeed 
the spirit of god lives in you and if anyone does not have the spirit of christ they do not belong to the spirit and not in the realm of the flesh i mean this world very much that's what we have seen in romans 8 chapter but the truth is there is a constant conflict isaac and ismael unable to get along same thing spirit and flesh cannot get along in our life in a believer's life then two contrast powerful contrast verses 19 to 21 talks about the works of the flesh 22 to 23 talks about the fruit of the spirit one is uh, uh, in continuation of the spirit and flesh works and fruit first difference is works is in plural fruit is in singular that shows very clearly that is uh, sins what are the uh, the sinful nature is making us to involve in different types of sins that is works of the flesh but when you are in the spirit fruit is in singular the whole character of a christian is given that's a definitely a clear cut uh, distinction you can see number 2 very clear uh, flesh will have works but fruit will have sorry spirit will have fruit so if you lead a worldly life you will be showing that in works but if you lead a holy life if you depend on the holy spirit spontaneously fruit will come that's very natural we all know that in mango season in summer holidays we get mangoes in winter season places like nagpur and other places we can see that it's filled with orange in apple season in himachal pradesh we can see full with apples how come it happens the tree which is planted in a right way and the soil is good and climate is good and uh, the resources are good spontaneously the fruit will come now bring it to your own life if you are in the spirit if you are rooted in the right way if you are experiencing god's presence and blessings upon you the spontaneous result is fruit you don't need to work hard in your spirit otherwise it will be the works of the spirit in these days there are some friends who are believers wanted to show their fruits by works of the fruit they wanted to show that very unfortunate and some of the churches they talk negative about spirit they don't believe in the work of the spirit fruit of the spirit and uh, they say that it is already over and now you need only god's word and god's fellowship uh, god's people are enough at the extreme some of the churches they promote uh, the spirit uh, control life and they go to an extreme saying that uh, the uh, being filled with the spirit means uh, uh, outward things we have to be careful i am not against uh, any uh, church doctrinal statements but my only concern is you have to be very careful if you say that you have the fruit of the spirit it is not that works of the spirit it is the fruit of the spirit and uh, in the passage we see that uh, works of the spirit is highlighted with uh, the sensual sins sensual sins that starts with that and it talks about uh, the superstitious sins idolatry which craft very sad and now we may say that i don't have idolatry but if we can keep anything in the place of jesus that is an idol and in these days as we see in paul's writing to ephesians we know that uh, to colossians we know that uh, the lust for money the materialistic thinking 
it's definitely idle. If you have greed, you became an, it became an idol for you. So this challenge is for all of us. That comes from the flesh. Third one, in the same list, he talks about uh, hatred, jealousy, uh, frictions, dissensions, all sorts of social sins are also highlighted. So these are all uh, exhibited by the flesh. These are the works of the flesh. It's a big list. But uh, verse 22 starts with, but the fruit of the spirit, but the fruit of the spirit. There are nine qualities are mentioned. It's almost like one orange. It's one fruit. And we need to have all the uh, qualities of a Christian. Don't simply say that I have love, but I don't have joy. In that way, you are not experiencing the fruit of the spirit. You have the work of the spirit, love. And uh, okay, uh, with the help of Holy Spirit, I have love, but uh, I'm going to work on uh, uh, peace later. It's not the way. The Christian character should reflect the fruit of the spirit together. And Warren Versby in a beautiful way, and even other commentators clearly mentions all these nine characters are put together in three categories. Love, joy, peace is a God word. God gives love, joy, and peace. Next three, uh, peace, forbearance, kindness. It is to us men. And goodness, faithful, I'm sorry, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is more of our uh, own self, uh, our character, our self-word. That means your Christian life cannot be compartmentalized. I am very good with God, but I am not very good with man. Not at all. And we need to have all the three areas of our life should have fruits. When you look at uh, these uh, qualities, it is not that we have to work hard. For example, um, it talks about gentleness or some versions can mention about meekness. And normally we say that uh, meekness and gentleness, we have to show it. It is from the heart. Moses was a meek, uh, full of meek. He was uh, a man with meekness. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Moses as a man of meekness. Sometimes we think that uh, if you are in the government job, if you are in a high position, if you are a leader, you cannot be meek. Not at all. Moses was handling lakhs of people and he was a leader, but God could testify in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, Moses was the most meekful person. So my dear brothers and sisters, in your young age, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. The self-control, gentleness, faithfulness, all these things should come within you. And with others, you need to be gentle, kind, forbearance, have to be reflected. So these are the fruit of the Spirit. Let's continue. And he does not stop there. Rather, he continues with that. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. That is the conclusion part of not of flesh, but of the Spirit. We have a Christian victory. Though we have a Christian conflict within us, the last passage talks about Christian victory. There are three things it's highlighted. Number one, crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. That's what we have done when we accepted Jesus Christ in our personal Savior and Lord. Then later, the sanctification process, constantly we do that. We commit our life to God and we confess our sins and we crucify the flesh with his passions and desires. Verse 25, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. So don't stop only that. Uh, anyway, I crucified myself in the cross. We need to live. We need to live by faith. We have to live by spirit. 
That's what he says in verse 25. And third one, very interesting, he says, you live in harmony with others. That shows that my personal commitment to God is very clear that uh, I have committed my life to Jesus. Now I lead a, a free life in terms of uh, no co commitment. That is wrong. I need to live by the Spirit. And also, I need to live in harmony. We cannot simply say that uh, I have faith uh, in God, but I don't love others. Not at all possible. Live in harmony. That's what he says. Let us not uh, uh, envy one another. Let us uh, love one another and live with one another joyfully. My dear brothers and sisters, uh, I'm going fast. But let me close this first, fifth chapter with this word. Though we have a Christian conflict in our life, Christian victory is very much possible, very much possible. If only you do these three things. Number one, be sure of a crucified flesh on the cross. Don't take back that uh, self. Don't take back the flesh. Leave it in the cross. Then don't uh, lead uh, just a, a casual life. Lead a life guided by the Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to control you. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. We know that uh, it talks about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Different uh, churches talk about the fullness of the Spirit different ways. I'm sure that you have right understanding. Bible says all of us have to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's not only for some people. When we accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit has come into our heart. Now we allow the Holy Spirit to control our life. When it, when it will happen, it's not one day. On every Sunday when we go to the lively church or when we are going in a, to a um, spiritual meeting where we commit ourselves in Holy Spirit's hand and Holy Spirit comes and upon us, 100% we are under the control. After coming from that meeting, after coming from the church, we can talk anything and we can do anything. That is not right. Not at all right. That is not the way uh, Bible talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. He is not uh, something like a power. He is a person. He has to control your life. So constantly allow the Spirit of God to control your life. In your day-to-day -day life, in your life and ministry, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. That will show how you live in a home, how you live with others. We hear many stories like that. They can speak in tongues and they say that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. But when they come out, the way in which they speak is nonsense. It's very sad, very bad. That shows that we are not living in harmony with others. So we need to have a Christian victory. So think of loving others. Think of le leading a life which is led by the Holy Spirit. Definitely after committing ourselves on the cross. That will give the Christian victory. Let's go to the last chapter, <clears throat> chapter 6. Two paragraphs. First uh, 10 verses talks about the true Christian relationship. It's a continuation of uh, chapter 5, verse 26. Here Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves so you also may be tempted. That's a big warning Paul gives. At the same time, he says, you have to save people. You have to share the burden of others. He continues with that same thought, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Earlier he was talking about the law which is giving about the sin. But here he says, law of Christ. What is law of Christ? It is love. It is sharing. It is bearing and caring others. That is the law of Christ. Do I have the law of Christ with me? He, here he says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, 
you will fulfill the law of Christ. Even in this evening, we need to check ourselves. Do I really care for others? Do I really ready to share the burdens of others? And the previous verse is very strong. There are people who live in sin and we wanted to save them. We want to help them. And we need to be careful that we are also not falling into that temptation. That's a big challenge. We see that uh, uh, in many, many uh, cases. Some of them, they fall in love and she knows that that boy is not a believer. And she will say that after marriage, I will bring him to Christ. And the same thing for boys also. She may not be a believer, but the boy will say that uh, because I have committed my life to her, I'm going to marry, but definitely I'll bring her. But we know that after the marriage, they uh, go back to their other faith or falling. That could be a strong uh, example. Even otherwise, we need to be very, very careful uh, when we help others. But Paul says you have to help other brother or sister fall into sin. You have to help, but be careful and share the burden. In verse uh, 5 and 6, for each one should carry their own load. Look at that verse 5. For each one should carry their own load. It is not the contradicting with verse uh, 2. Because in the same passage, verse 2 says, carry each other's burdens. And in verse 5, it says, uh, each one should carry their own load. That means, if a person is responsible, don't uh, just take the responsibility on you and leave it. A very simple example. I'm an husband. I'm a father. And I cannot leave this responsibility to others. And I need to carry my own load. Hear me? Same thing. Same thing. So you have to help others, but not at the cost of taking everything and leaving that person to be lazy. Counseling, not, not even a Christian counseling. General counseling says that you have to help others to help themselves. That's the definition for counseling. Help others to help themselves. You have to really assist. You have to really understand. You have to really hear from them. And you have to really help them so that uh, they can find out the way and they can carry their own burden. So I want to title it like build up people. Don't destroy them in uh, giving too much of uh, facilities. And don't spoil them in terms of taking all the responsibilities. Build them up so that they can carry their own load on their And uh, this is the way he says, you have to be uh, thoughtful about others. You have to care and bear one another's burden. It's a lovely passage. And he continues with the same thought, but a little differently. Here he says, nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the world uh, should share all good things about the instructors he's talking, but seven to 10, it's very clear, showing and reaping. Even to the instructor, it's uh, applicable. But here we see that do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So whatever you sow, definitely you're going to reap. We have to be careful about it. And uh, here he says, whoever shows to please the flesh, from the flesh, we, they will reap destruction. Whoever shows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. So all of us as believers, we want to show our life and our love, our commitment to others. It's uh, to please the spirit. Naturally, we'll be reaping and it is an eternal blessings. That's what he's talking about. When you look at the teaching of Jesus, he said, invest uh, yourself in the heavenly things, not on the worldly things. That's a lovely thought. So when you help others, you are investing in the bank of heaven. 
Jesus says, with true love, if you give a cup of water to another person, it will be counted as your investment, as your blessings. What a great truth it is. So keeping that in mind, let us uh, develop a relationship with others with a true love. And let's show this uh, uh, to please the spirit. He continues with verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if you do not give up. It is a continuation of reaping. Showing is showing love. We may not be like Mother Teresa. We may not be like Otto Raja. He was recognized as a great uh, um, person who helps underprivileged people. We may not be like them, but definitely in our own situations, we need to uh, help people. Let us not become weary in doing good. Wherever it is possible, we have to involve in doing good for others. Verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to the, those who belong to the family of believers. Here he is, during the end of his letter, he wanted to say that uh, uh, you help the poor people. And I have to tell you that uh, uh, in Acts 15 chapter, in the um, Jerusalem Council, James and others told uh, Paul and Barnabas, saying that you continue the ministry among the Gentiles and don't compel them to become a Jew, to become a Christian. And let them be careful about the blood. Then they said, lastly, they said, you be concerned about the poor people in Jerusalem. And Paul said, yes, very much. I'm very much thinking of it. Because in Jerusalem church, they could not take care of the poor people. And Paul had a big project. Paul and Barnabas did it. And to Romans, he writes like this, for Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed, they owe to it to them. They are in a different place, Macedonia, Achaia, and they have decided to help the God's people in Jerusalem. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jewish, uh, Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. What a beautiful thought he is sharing. We have received the spiritual blessings from Jews. And now the Jews in Jerusalem, the Christians are struggling. And we have a tremendous responsibility to show our love by giving our material blessings. So my dear brothers and sisters, uh, as we uh, read this passage, how much we develop such Christian relationship with others. It is not simply saying that I love you. Rather, we show it in action. And we really share their burden. And we also share our resources with others. And it says, especially to, the, to those who belong to the family of believers. Even as we close this uh, book of Galatians, remember, it is not only a good Christian doctrine on uh, grace. We need to have a grace in sharing, grace in giving. Let's come to the, uh, we have come to the last passage. Verse 11, he says, uh, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. He talks about Paul's weakness. Uh, many believe that uh, he had a, a difficulty in eye. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he says, I pleaded to God for three times, but God did not remove that, uh, um, but God has allowed me, and God gave me a promise. In your weakness, my strength will be exhibited. There he said, God promised, my grace is sufficient for you. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. And Paul's weakness was reality in his body. And if, if it is so, how come he has written all these 13 letters? He used 
the scribes to write but uh, in the end he has taken the pen and he has written and in niv we can read that the word the large letters even people say that uh, because of his problems he might have written little uh, bigger uh, words that could be one possibility and thus far people have written and now i am going to write so from his own hand he is writing even you can see the same thing in first corinthians chapter 16 and in second thessalonians chapter 3 here he says in my own hands i greet you that means he wanted to take the pen and write i greet you that the grace of god be with you it's something like we put a signature old people they will dictate the letter and somebody can write and after that they will put the signature and uh, to the corinthians and to the thessalonians paul could say that i wanted to write my greetings to you in my own hands here instead of greetings he writes a passage that is his first letter you remember that it's a first letter and he writes a big passage and he shares his heart even in his writing 12 to 14 i'm sorry 12 and 13 he talks about the people who are legalists those who want to impress people by means of flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross, for the cross of Christ. They want you to be uh, circumcised because they wanted to uh, be away from persecution if they don't talk about the cross. And uh, cross means persecution. Cross means suffering. And these friends who are afraid of the Jews, they want to compromise with the Jews. And they are going to say that, uh, yes, these people are coming to know the Lord, and I'm going to compel them to take circumcision. Everything is fine for the Jewish leaders. My brothers and sisters, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the uh, cross, you cannot afford to compromise in your life. And they became hypocrites. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. Look at that. They may boast in your circumcision. What a pathetic uh, uh, condition of the legalists. My brothers and sisters, we have to be definitely careful. In these days, there are many, many legalists coming in our fellowship, in our churches especially. And they have the set things. They wanted to uh, get a good name from the government. Or they don't want to get uh, persecution from non-Christians. So they wanted to protect themselves. And uh, by giving such uh, some of the outward rules to you, they wanted to protect themselves their position. They are all legalists. Don't be a legalist. Then he says, I boast on the cross of Christ. Look at 14. May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Very interesting way in which he describes the cross. I want to boast on the cross, not with a golden cross or not with a very big wooden cross in the church. Of course, it's nothing wrong to have a golden cross in your neck or in your fingers, but uh, boast the cross through your life. As you face challenges, as you face problems because of the faith, are we ready to take the cross? Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you take up the cross and follow me. What is that cross? And he says, your cross. And all of us, as a child of God, as a disciple of Lord Jesus Christ, we have our challenges, including facing the legalists. And we have to take up the cross and follow him. As I said earlier, the book of Galatians is uh, many references on cross. And we need to study 
Paul's perspective on cross. Even here, in a very nice way, he says, um, I boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, through which the world has been crucified to me. Look at that. When I look at the cross, the world is on the cross. The world has been crucified to me. And secondly, I to the world. When I look at the cross, I am on the cross. And the world is somewhere out. So it is separating me from the world. That's what exactly he says. The cross, if I have right understanding of the cross, it separates me from the world. Yesterday we saw that the cross has uh, taken the shame, curse for me. That's a very powerful message. In the Old Testament, when we see that when the sin has come, the first problem with Adam and Eve was shame. They felt ashamed. But in the cross, Jesus has taken the shameful death so that that shame can be removed. That curse can be removed. That is a blessing of the cross. And yesterday, day before yesterday, we saw that because of cross, not I, but Christ. And I am crucified with Christ. If you are sure of that one, what a great uh, relief for all of us. Uh, may the Lord help each one of us to take the cross very seriously. And the last point, he talks about a branded for God's glory. I bear on my bo uh, body the marks of Jesus. The marks of Jesus. I am free indeed. And I keep that uh, mark. It's something like a brand for God's glory. I keep it. Someone has written very nicely about bearing in these two chapters. Fruit bearing, that is there very much in uh, chapter 5, verses 22, 23. Fruit bearing. By leading a uh, spirit-filled life, definitely the sp we are bearing the spirit, uh, the fruit of the spirit. Chapter 6, verse 2, burden bearing. We are bearing the burden of others. That's a calling for all of us. Verses 7 and 9, it talks about seed bearing. That means we do things so that we can reap. That also is a bearing. Do good things. Be concerned about others. I'm not selfish. Seed bearing. And last one, it's a very powerful one. Brand bearing. I am a child of God. I am under the cross of Christ. And he has kept, he has kept it in his body. So with a great uh, uh, blessing, the grace of God will be all of us. With, with the, the grace of God, the Lord Jesus will be with all of us so that we can have such a brand name for the glory of God. We have come to the last uh, uh, stage in the book of Colossians. We go back. The personal Christian testimony is highlighted in two chapters. Doctrinal Christian teaching is given in chapters 3 and 4. And today, we looked at the practical Christian life. And let me close with these questions. How do I bear the fruit of the Spirit? I don't need to uh, work hard. It is not work of the Spirit, uh, work of the fruit. It is spontaneous. How I can do that? Do I give importance to the cross of Christ in my life? If so, how? Oh. And definitely, what are the ways in which I can teach others from Galatians? Not necessarily a Bible study, but can you think of uh, taking the passages, taking the thoughts, taking the words, uh, write a uh, song? I know that one of the participants is very good in writing song. I encourage him to write a song from the book of Galatians. Others, what are the ways in which you can teach others from Galatians, do it. God bless you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this lovely book. We are excited that we have studied the first book of the New Testament. And we have clearly understood the Christian doctrines. And now, help me and help us to put it in practice, to enjoy that Christian life. Lord, till we meet again, let your presence be very real to us. I pray for my brothers and sisters who are busy with the studies and busy with those jobs and many of them could not join with us and we pray that you bless them even others who are following 
the Bible studies in YouTube. We pray, oh God, that you bless them. And in the days to come, as we are going to uh, go back to the Old Testament uh, uh, prophecy, we pray, oh God, that you prepare us so that we can be uh, ministered through your word in this fellowship. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.